Debbie, thank you for your great meeting minutes. We'll officially start at 7.32. And um, we're very excited to have our amazing guest speaker today. But first, let's uh, quickly get the minutes approved from our last meeting on May 13th, 2021. Hopefully everybody got a chance to review. Um, Let's take a moment, and if we're ready, I'll entertain a motion to approve. I motion to approve the minutes. All right, thanks, Steve. Do I have a second? I second it. Okay, thank you, Adam. So we have a motion from Steve, second from Adam. Any discussion? All right, we have to do roll call vote. So I will start Tanya Bodell. Uh, motion to approve the minutes, Tanya Bodell, aye. Uh, I'll go. Steve Winter, aye. Adam Amon, aye. Tyler Thibault, aye. Debbie, are you going to vote? Oh, you're on mute, Debbie. Aye again. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so the minutes are approved. Thank you very much. We will um, forward those for posting. Um, and the next item on our agenda is Representative Machino. Thank you so much for coming. And we're so looking forward to hearing about the new legislation that has been passed to support the environment and climate. And um, I, I, I will let you introduce yourself, but I think you need no introduction. You've been doing such great work and we always run into each other at these things, but it's so great to see you and thank you for joining our Alternative Energy Committee. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Um, so I'm a state representative, Joan Mosquino, representing 3rd Plymouth District, which is Hingham Hull, North Situate, and of course, the fabulous town of Cohasset. Um, I am just delighted Steve Wenner reached out to me um, to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is the 2050 roadmap, now the um, Next Generation uh, Roadmap for Climate Policy. And I, I did put together um, some slides just to help us walk through. Um, so if you want to let me share screen, I can um, put those on. Uh, all right. So let me see. Uh, I think you have to allow me to, to share the screen. You should have the ability now. OK, let's try this. All right. Uh, did I do that correctly? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Let's see if I can get it to go from the beginning. Yeah, oh, I'm getting good at this. Um, but it, it really is lovely to be with you all tonight. Um, I, I just wish it was in person soon. Soon enough, we will get there. Um, but I, um, I did want to just share a few slides to help us walk through um, sort of the material, and then we can certainly um, discuss and have whatever questions or however you want to run the forum um, is totally fine with me. Um, obviously, um, you all know that I, I talk about it all the time, uh, that I am the primary author of the 2050 Roadmap, um, which was filed last session and uh, went through a very interesting legislative process and then was finally um, passed and signed into law this session. Um, you know, for me, the issues of climate change present as public safety, public health, environmental change, social justice impact, but the solution is actually economic and it's the decarbonization of our economy. And when I got into the legislature, I was really looking, and you know me, I. I, I, I think very strategically and very, um, I look for the things that are foundational and incremental. And so um, I was immediately sort of saying, all right, how do I prioritize all these really fabulous bills? You know, and what I discovered was we need a plan. And now we have one. Um, so let's see if I can do this correctly. Aha, here we go. So. The, I filed the 2050 roadmap and what ended up happening was, uh, it's, a, it's a highly complex subject matter, but the bill, the 2050 roadmap bill itself 
was actually very simple. It's five pages long. And it was really um, meant to be um, the sort of the critical updates, if you will, to the Global Warming Solutions Act. The GWSA is where we originally made the commitment to decarbonize our economy, to shrink our, um, our carbon emissions as a state. Um, and it had great success. And the first 10 years, you've heard me give this presentation before, um, really, you know, there was a series of um, really great initiatives that came out. And in fact, we're on, we're on track and I would expect the numbers for 2020 to come out that we achieved our original um, 2020 goal. Um, but the problem was, is that, as I said, there was no plan for what was the next years. And so the 2050 roadmap was plan was really meant to be that 30 year plan to decarbonize our economy. It was meant to align us with science. Um, it was requiring a back cast analysis, um, looking at multiple pathways instead of just energy. Um, it was mindful of the socioeconomic and EJ impacts. Um, and it set, it set um, really strong interim goals. Um, and it, the point of it was um, to be ambitious and drive innovation. And it was intended to be a very iterative, iterative process with good transparency, accountability, ro robust reporting. And it was really meant to try to get the agencies to work together on, on all of the other sectors. And now it's, um, it's been put into law and the roadmap bill itself, although small, ended up coming out of, um, of EMRA and it went to House Ways and Means very early. We were able to advocate to get it an early hearing and it to advance very early. And what that did was it ended up being the vehicle for a lot of other amazing legislation. And so that is how the 2050 roadmap became to be this much larger piece of, of legislation, um, the next generation climate roadmap. And I have to, I'll just gonna pause here because I'm a House member and I was very proud of the legislation that came out of the House of Representatives. It was really an elegant piece of legislation. And I thought the chair did an amazing job. Um, and my colleagues, we had been saying every step of the way, you know, just, just get this to the floor and then file your amendments and add to it and build on it. And they did, and it was beautiful. It really, it was really amazing. So now we've got this piece of legislation that the governor signed into law on March 26th. And the question I think everybody has been asking, like yourselves, was, this was the conversation Steve and I had was, what is next? So what I thought I would just do is um, give you a quick update about what's actually made it through the whole process. Um, House bill, Senate bill, conference committee, back and forth between the governor. Um, so I just thought I'd give you like a really quick primer on what's in there. Um, then I thought I would talk about the 2050 roadmap itself and the implementation, uh, talk a little bit about legislation and then talk a little bit about local action, if that's okay. And then we can absolutely do question and answer and I'll, I'll move through this pretty quickly for you guys. Um, so the key components of the, the, the 2050 roadmap um, basically all made it into the next generation climate roadmap. It was the codifying um, the new GWSA target for net zero by 2050. Uh, there were the strong interim targets of 2030 and 2040. Those interim goals um, mean that it has to be at least 50% and 75%. And we talked about it as a straight line. Um, and that's a floor, not a ceiling. Uh, the governor fussed about both of those things. Um, the 2050 roadmap itself, um, if you recall, was meant to be, um, a it's a technical document, um, but it's that 30 year schedule of carbon emission reductions and then the plan and the strategy to implement it. It integrated across six sectors. So not just about energy, but the six sectors. And the Senate then improved it and built in these five-year evaluation periods on the sector-specific emission reductions. Um, it included a new definition for natural lands or nature-based solutions. Um, that's the 15% um, for carbon sinks, um, if you'll recall, got added in there. Um, it was all the planning was meant to be done through a people-centric lens. 
which is my way of talking about sort of the EJ, the socioeconomic, the, the racial justice lens. And we actually, people talk about how are we gonna do this? I, we built that into the analysis and the assessment on the mechanisms of this bill. Um, and then it had strong um, reporting requirements, which is for transparency and accountability out to both the public, as well as to the legislature is built into the whole work plan. And the idea is, I refer to it as being iterative, but it's really meant to be that interplay of, of how is the administration now going to tackle this plan? And then what pieces of policy does the, um, the legislature need to be putting in place to make that all happen? Um, as you know, so that was the, that was the roadmap bill itself. Um, built into the larger um, climate roadmap bill um, was environmental justice language, which of course included a, a, a definition actually codified into law. If you'll recall, that was all just environmental justice was all of an executive order. Um, and it actually talks now about environmental burdens and climate change. Uh, it mandates environmental impact reports for projects um, that have air, air quality impacts one, one mile within an EJ neighborhood. It requires DEP to conduct stakeholder process um, to develop cumulative impact analysis. Think about the compressor station and how important that would have been to us to fighting that. It increased regulations and fines for for um, gas pipeline safety violations. There were pilot programs for like geothermal heat pumps, micro districts. Um, it also amended DPU's mission to um, balance equity and greenhouse gas emissions, um, which they've opened, um, I think they call it opening a docket and they're asking some of these questions now. Um, and it requires $12 million be given annually to Mass CEC to support environmental justice communities, women-owned businesses, um, fossil fuel workers, these kinds of, these kinds of pieces. Um, it also had a lot of energy efficiency in there. Josh Cutler got his Mass Save program. I've, I always love his slogan. It's the, it's the best bill because it's the energy that you, you never use. Um, and it also requires um, things like an opt-in for net zero stretch building codes. Um, it talks about, um, uh, what else was it? I think it was um, updating the existing stretch code, uh, which by the way, about 80% of our communities already have. Uh, and then there was also more about the Board of Building uh, Regulations and Standards, BBRS. Um, you know, the commissioner is now, um, we specified, I think we expanded the, um, we expanded it to, fifth, I think it's 11 members to 15 now. Um, the new members have to be from DOER. They have to be an expert, the subject matter expertise around residential buildings, advanced building technology, commercial buildings, things of that nature. And then of course, renewable energy, which of course is so important to, um, to our communities and we've made that commitment. Um, but I'm not sure most people realize that um, we actually included, we increased the RPS, the Renewable Portfolio Standards, to 3% annually, um, building up to 40%. Um, and uh, it, we also did a lot around authorizing more offshore wind. Uh, I think we would reach the, uh, I'm just trying to think, I feel like we're gonna reach our Renewable Portfolio Standards 3% annually to 40% by 2030, which is very ambitious. Um, it would reduce some of the barriers to low income um, participation to um, solar programs. And it would also include a clean energy standard for municipal light plants, which was something that MLPs actually brought forward um, themselves. I had originally written it indifferently, uh, but they, they came forward voluntarily um, and, and sought to participate in this as part, um, as part of their own clean energy standards, which mirrors everything for um, our regular investor owned utilities. And of course, Hull and Hingham already lead in this space, um, but that was, um, that was actually a really great piece, I think that got added in there. And I was really proud of our MLPs for stepping forward and saying that they wanted to be part of the solution. Um, so, 
the 2050 roadmap itself. So that's what's in the bill. Now the bill is in place. And the question is, what do we do with it? So as part of the implementation, they actually produced, um, and it, this was going on concurrent as the, the legislation was advancing. And it was done by and large um, consistent with the way the legislation was written because we were advocating um, all along. It was very much a stakeholder kind of a process, very much a dialogue. And I was talking regularly with um, the administration. So they, they knew what was in the legislation and they knew what was coming. Um, and so they, they did it very consistently and they created a 2050 decarbonization roadmap. Um, it was published at the end of December. Uh, I put the, um, the URL there. You can go and look at it yourself. It's a technical document and it's, it's what the carbon emission reduction schedule will be. It has eight pathways um, with an equity assessment as we talked about earlier. Um, a lot of transparency went into sort of the development and the dialogue and the process and the public participation. It's comprehensive across all sectors. And as I said, it has the eight pathways, which is meant to give it some flexibility. And the idea is that, you know, we're supposed to be doing these things concurrently. And, you know, if one path isn't working, then there are others to follow. Um, as part of that, the next piece that came, once that technical document was in place, the next piece that they had to tackle was what is the plan for the next 10 years? And so um, EEA has been going through a process, I'm sure many of you followed it, um, to develop the 2030 Clean Energy Climate Plan. And that we expect will be published in July. Um, you, many of you might recall that they had actually done the lion's share of this work earlier, um, but then there were some changes through the legislative, through once the, the bill came out, um, you know, in the conference between House and Senate and dialogues with the governor's office and EEA, things did change. And so they're right now they're reviewing the 2030 plan, the CECP, um, to make sure it's aligned with the way that the legislation came out. And then they will publish that in July. And I, you can look at the draft report. They had a robust public comment period. Um, you can take a look at all of that online and I encourage you to do it. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention to everyone is that as part of the original 20, um, excuse me, the GWSA, they put in place at that time in 2008, an implementation advisory committee. It has met for the past 12 years, for 14 years. Um, and it is, uh, I just wanted to note it to everyone because there's many activists in this listening on this, on this call. And um, it's a great place to watch, to monitor the activity um, of the administration in the implementation of these bills. Um, and it's a great place um, to advocate. Um, and the whole point of the roadmap was to really, as I said, create the transparency, the robust reporting, uh, the, that real public participation. I mean, I think I think it's got it's on a reporting schedule for like, so I don't think that changed. I think it's like every, I think it's like every three years. So it's it's always being reevaluated and reassessed um, relative to our success and relative to uh, our advancement toward the goals. And the, piece, the reason this is so important is to have not just that accountability out to the public, but also to legislature, because this is ambitious. We are decarbonizing our economy. And we're looking ahead and planning for, for 30 years. And you're all in municipal government. It is like, we're lucky if we can do five-year planning, right, successfully. So to plan for 30 years is very ambitious and it's going to take all of us really participating in this process so that we can push for the kind of innovation that's really going to lead um, to our success. We can't just think about what it is we can do now. We have to think about what needs to come next. So I did just also want to talk a little bit about um, legislation and budget. Um, just to give you a quick update, um, the House and the Senate um, have gone through their, their budgeting process. And I, I should have updated this. I didn't look to see what the Senate did um, on, on some of the green funding. Um, I, 
didn't up, didn't think to update this the slide, but we are right now they're in conference committee reconciling the changes between our budgets. But the house did increase the green budget line items, um, 4.9% over the governor's original budget, which is referred to as House One. I just wanted to share with you that I always advocate for um, DER, um, the uh, Division of uh, Ecological Restoration. I, I always advocate for that in my, when I speak to um, House Ways and Means, and I was able to secure additional funding of $2.4 million um, for, you know, things like dam removals and ecological restoration, uh, which is important to our district. And then I did just want to note, because there was some confusion, and I, I don't know how many people sort of became aware of it, but um, we reaffirmed that the legislature really did intend to um, put out, procure an additional 5,600 um, megawatts of wind. Um, and EEA read the legislation differently, and the House chair um, put that in to make sure that it was crystal clear, um, because they, were, they thought it was, um, they, they were subtracting, we were only adding 4,000, and we're like, no, that's not what we're, we're being bold here. Um, I also just wanted to update you a little bit on legislation. Um, you know, as I was saying, now it's incumbent upon us as the administration is undertaking all of this work to be following closely and to be advocating for the policy pieces that need to be put in place for, to implement all of this. And so, um, so you know, since I'm your state rep, I thought I'd just share with you a little bit of the bills that I filed this session looking ahead to the work, right? Because the, the, the high level policy piece is in place and now we really need to jump to the work of it. Um, and these are the, the sectors that I just feel that have the most urgency. I mean, you've heard me say this presentation before and I think it's a statistic you all know, transportation, um, is 43% of Massachusetts state emissions right now. So I have filed three bills um, um, that deal with um, zero emission vehicles. Um, the first um, is uh, House 3541, which um, would pro proposes a mandate that no new registrations for light duty vehicles, um, you know, internal combustion vehicles, um, would be registered in the state after 2035. Uh, this is consistent. We can talk about these details if you want. This is very consistent with what's going on in the industry, what the 2050 roadmap's calling for, what states like you know, California are doing. Um, and it's, I think, 27% emissions come from those light um, duty vehicles. I also filed um, House um, 3255 um, with Rep. Christine Barber, which would, which would require public and um, public serving fleets um, to become 100% electrified by 2035. So think like school buses or you know things like that on, on, a, on a college campus, you know those kinds of things. And then I also filed House 3347. Um, which is really, an, I think of it as an infrastructure build out that's necessary to um, encourage and to promote the use of zero emission vehicles. So it's things like creating opportunity and infrastructure for time of use rates. Um, it's um, the more EV expanding it for low and moderate income um, folks for point of sale, right? Rebates at point of sale. Um, major parking infrastructure, you know, being capable, EV capable, um, EV char um, charging infrastructure um, supported throughout the states within municipalities, that kind of a thing. The other piece that, the other sector where I feel there's great urgency is the building decarbonization. Uh, so whereas we all transit, we all transfer, we sort of turn over our vehicles within sort of three, five, seven years, we have a lot of opportunity to glean some really quick benefits with electric vehicles because people are always transitioning and changing over their cars. With buildings, it's the opposite. Whereas you, you know, I bought this house, I've lived here for 20 years, let's hope I live here for another 40. Um, and so we filed a very comprehensive bill um, that really is the first one to start to tackle the decarbonization. And it's, it's both looking at the, the, the prospective um, new buildings 
a net zero um, energy code. Um, now, right now, you can, they're, they're, the law says that it's opt-in. This would start to promote it um, as required. Um, but we're also put some provisions in around um, deep retrofits of existing buildings. So think about things like changes to mass save to the BBRS, actually creating a commercial PACE program, um, adding to the, the current uh, residential PACE program, and, um, you know, and, and taking those kinds of steps because that's the piece that we just, we don't transition over our homes. And so that's gonna be the hardest piece for us to get at. And so there's some, there's a lot of urgency there to really um, tackle that soon. Uh, I think the governor said we need something like 1 million homes to be um, electrified over the next 30 years. And so we have to start tackling these things. The other bill I'll just mention to you um, is access to justice house um, 1793. Um, so if you th this is really a civil rights bill. And what it basically says is that if there is a disparate impact on any civil rights, it, it, it's a standing bill. It creates the right in a Massachusetts resident to file a claim in a Massachusetts court um, for a civil rights infraction for disparate impact, which is just to say that there was a pub, there was a policy, a law that was neutral on its face, was probably well intended, but has a has a disproportionate um, discriminatory impact on a protected class. Um, and I filed this with Rep. Madero, um, and it was inspired by the compressor station and the need for environmental justice language. So now that we have the EJ language is there, now we need to have a right that people can avail themselves of in court. Um, there is a suite of other bills. Um, I have Bill Envy. Um, my colleagues filed a tremendous amount of legislation this year around all of um, these and um, other sectors as well. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at them. Um, they're really a lot of, of pretty interesting things. Um, you know, natural lands and carbon sequestration, um, transportation, um, transitioning from carbon-based fuels, um, renewable portfolio standards is the 100% renewable bill, recycling, that's another big one, carbon pricing. Um, so there's a lot of really cool, interesting things that are going on out there. Um, it's gonna be a very exciting, uh, very exciting legislative session. And we're all looking forward to seeing how the next climate bill will be shaped. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of opportunity there. So the last thing I just wanted to touch on was of course, uh, local action. Um, so for my part, um, this was all happening at the state level and fingers crossed, let's hope it also happens at the federal level. Um, and Massachusetts leads by, you know, leads by example. Um, but really at the end of the day, uh, this, this is probably the most effective if it, if and when it's embraced at the local level. And, you know, if you think about the building programs that we're putting out now, um, you know, if you decide to buy it, um, Hingham is building a new school, this will be built into, um, into their building structure. They're going to have to make sure it's energy efficient. There's going to be requirements. There's going to be incentives to projects that, um, that prioritize these things, mass works, um, library building grants. Um, we, are, we are starting to incentivize that resilience and that adaptation and the mitigation pieces. Um, Green Communities Act, um, there's going to be, there's already been tremendous amount of, of money coming down through the Green Communities Act. You know, most everybody who's in the Green Communities Act has already agreed to adopt the stretch code. And so again, incentivizing um, through, through state dollars into the, the communities to really help them embrace this and to help them make this part of the state investments in the local communities. But at the end of the day, it really starts with you as, um, as the Alternative Energy Committee in Hingham, it's the net, net zero committee hull. It's, um, it's, a it's a renewable energy committee. Um, and really it's action starts at the local level. And to the ex it's the work that you are doing. It's all of the things that you are leading on. And, you know, I feel, I really feel like 
you know, we've put certain things in place at the state and we can, we can incentivize all we want, but it really comes down to whether or not you are prepared um, to take action. Um, the municipality does not require the, the municipalities to actually do anything other than they want to do, um, but it does permit you to enact a stricter stretch code, um, you know, to protect environmental po justice populations, um, to ensure equity as considered in all of the utilities and the regulations. And so, you know, through things like municipal aggregation and making microgrids and, and making all of these things possible. But at the end of the day, we can't make you apply them. So it really comes down to all of the fantastic work that you're doing. And, um, and I just, I applaud you for your interests and your commitment. And uh, I hope you found this update informative and interesting. And I just appreciate that you invited me to come. I'm always happy to talk about this and I'm happy to answer any questions or feel in any discussion uh, that you all are, are interested in having. And I'll just throw this last slide up there for a few seconds. Um, you know, if, as always, and we're talking policy today, but um, this is still a public meeting and I will just say that constituent services tend are our top priority. And so, you know, please, jot down any of this and let us know if there's anything we can do to be of service or even if you just want to talk shop. Great. So I'll conclude there and toss it back over um, to the chair. Great. So I, I'm so sad that Carrie Thompson, our select person, just dropped off. I was going to give her some um, a thank you for attending, but she said she has to jump off, but she's enjoyed the talk, as have we. And so I think now, Joan, we'll open it up for questions and see if there's anybody attending who would like to ask uh, representative questions about climate action or anything else. Steve. Uh, Joan, do, do you see any additional incentives coming down the pike to help municipalities uh, uh, get more uh, renewable energy and other things, other programs going, housing, whatnot? Yes, I do. I think that once um, the 2030 um, clean energy um, climate plan comes out, I think what you're going to start to see is that is that the administration is, is going to start tackling the work. And what the Baker administration um, has has shown, I mean, this is demonstrated over his past term, um, has really been a proclivity to create these big grant programs. So like, for example, I mentioned my, um, my buildings bill. One of, the, one of the provisions in there would be to, um, to build out the Green Communities Act. And the whole point is to dedicate those funding and funnel it through, um, through these grant programs. Uh, they're not necessarily entitlement programs, um, but they're still competitive but it's really meant to get money into the hands. Um, we fund de technical assistance all the time, both through programs like uh, MassWorks or Green Communities in particular, or through our regional planners. And I think what you're going to what you're going to see is um, is real incentives um, for for communities. Um, the Community Compact, that's another great program that you use all the time. MassWorks, that's another one. And that's what you're gonna to start to see is that, um, is the administration starting to um, put in, um, there's sort of like, there's a, are you ready for this program and are you doing what, you know, whatever it is you're doing, right? Whatever that program is. And then they have sort of check boxes and it's like, are you, do you have an open space? Do you have, do you have, you know, you know, whatever plans, right? And that's zero plan, do you have these things? And so that's really what the Green Communities Act is all about is aligning the communities around these things. It's volunteer, you come in um, and, but with it comes obligations like adopting a stretch code, et cetera, um, but then, from that flows the investments that the administration will start to be making. And um, you, I think you'll see that coming um, soon. We also, I'll just note that um, we, it's still unclear to me what the federal stimulus bills will look like in terms of infrastructure, um, but the Biden administration see, is determined to start 
flowing money in, not just for things like revenue replacement and getting us through the pandemic, but I, you'll start to see actual stimulus bills flow. If you think back to 2008, that was how they'll do it. And, um, and I think you'll see that, um, that the Baker administration and the legislature will continue to make those investments um, in municipal and state infrastructure. Part of this is also, um, not to be so long-winded, but is about really sending a signal out to the larger business and industry communities about the way we, the certainty, what we expect, how we want people to participate. And I think what you're going to see also is investment in certain sectors like the green sector, uh, much the way we did a while, what the, I think was the Patrick administration did in the biotech sector is really to see that we have all of that knowledge um, and thought leadership in our academic universities and we have real ability for innovation in the state. And so, you know, like I, I, people, I know people think it's funny that when I talk about this stuff, I'm not talking about so much environmental health, I'm talking about econo economic development. And I think you're gonna see real economic development and investments coming both in the municipal side of things, but also in the green sector side of things flow from all of this. Um, so do you see some uh, enhancements uh, in the Mass Save program and the Solar Rise Plus programs? And mm -hmm. uh, Yes, I'm proposing some. So we'll see how it goes and how that, that does. Um, part of this allocates $12 million to Mass CEC, which is the Clean Energy Center. And so, I mean, they will be the ones who will figure this out and actually do the work. And they work, um, they also work in hand with the, the larger sort of New England Clean Energy Center. And then, you know, there's also more sort of more locally based um, organizations like Greentown Labs and sort of really, you know, putting money there for, for that sort of idea sort of bench to market, right? And, and innovation in that space. So that I think those are places where we've already started making investments. The other piece that I'll just remind everyone, I, I'm sure you've been reading about it in the paper is that, you know, we have procured or we have designated for procurement um, a substantial amount of megawatts of wind. And as we're looking at that, um, you know, it's all of the, um, uh, I'm sorry, I just spaced on the name of the, the town where um, where the port where they're going to be, you know, they'll have that's the, the port that where everything I can't believe I can't think of it it's because I'm trying too hard. But anyway, so the it's all of the, um, you know, that's where they'll have all of the, um, the wind um, sort of um, assembly, uh, everything will be received there, that will be the, the launching off point for, you know, building all of the offshore turbines. Those kinds of investments generate not just jobs, um, but they're good for the local economy more broadly there. Um, the other piece of it is that will come along is, uh, I don't know if, if you've kind of thought this, this is not, most people don't think about it in this granular level, but with all of these additional um, megawatts of wind and all of the, you know, the growing distributed solar, um, we're going to have to be thinking about a lot of our grid modernization. And so again, that's construction, that's, that's investments made in our systems. And again, that puts people to work and it generates a lot of, of churn in the economy. Um, and then if I didn't mention it in this presentation, but in a different presentation I do, you know, we talk a lot about the um, workforce development. Um, you know, from my perspective, this is really meant to be sort of a, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, right? So it's really about how do we, you know, how do we put money into and sort of transition people who might be losing jobs into the jobs of the future, um, but also making sure that we have the workforce to do the jobs here and keep them locally in Massachusetts. Um, and, it, and it increase everybody's economic prosperity. So there's a role for everybody here. It's really quite exciting. Oh, come on, you have questions for me. I know you have questions for me. Joan, I do have a, Joan, I do have a question. You know, Hi, is, how you doing? So, you know, you know, as a, you know, as a utility in Hingham and, you know, obviously in Hull, you know, we have to obviously maintain our distribution systems to meet the future electrification demands. Um, 
I'm not so so much worried about you know us and Hull because you know we we do that. We always maintain our system, but us Cohasset residents, we live in national grid uh, territory. What is there any incentives for them to start? doing work now to meet the future demands for electrifications? So this is a great, it's such a great question. Um, So it's something that the legislature is is looking at now. And I can't remember who filed the bill, but there's definitely some grid modification and upgrade bills that are out there. The other thing that's happening is, um, is the DPU actually, I feel like they call it opening a docket. one of the, to your point, right, we usually have sort of like, say, a, we transition from coal and and natural and, um, and oil to natural gas, but it's like, it's still a power, a power plant from which all things generate out. But now what we're doing is, is much more, to your point, distributive. Um, and so it's not only about old systems um, that are sort of patchwork and don't necessarily make sense the way we've developed our communities and how we're trying to reach right communities. It's also about, are we prepared for the actual electrification that we're talking about, right? So it's kind of both things. It's both, are we keeping up the system and are we, are we increasing the system so that it can actually handle the new load, right? Because that's what a lot of this is, is really is about is, you know, I think the governor's, I think the 2030 um, CECP talks about like 1.1 million cars and like nearly a, like a million homes have to be electrified between now and 2030. And so it's, it's both about increased demand, but also where the demand is and how it's coming. So, I mean, DPU actually opened a docket to look at this very question. And the other piece that becomes important is how do you pay for it, right? So right yeah. now, if you're in a municipal light plant, you you know, Hull just did this actually, they decided to do a surcharge because they have two needs coming up. They're going to have to decommission um, Hull in one at some point, although knock on wood, it's still going great. Um, but they're going to also have to upgrade for a mi- additional demand and the system. So they just put a surcharge on, everyone's fine with it um, to plan ahead for that. But the way that, that the rate pair, the rate sort of assessments work on um, investor owned utilities is always like you put the investments in and then you try to get it through the rate paying process. But if we're doing distributive energy, how is, how is that all paying into the larger system? So it's, it's a really, you've asked like what I think is a, a super interesting question. Um, and DPU is really, has started to look at that and is going through that public public process right now to ask that question so So i don't have the answer but it's good good. so i do have one more question and you know so in and i can speak from the hingham light pot on the distribution side is that you know as of late we're we're adding transformers and trans like today we added uh, a larger transformer to meet a demand of this lady's uh new tesla and so we're you know we're noticing we're you know taking down old stuff putting up new stuff service sizes are getting larger. We had a house that's 100% electric with solar. Now this guy kind of cheated. He, he has an indoor pool and an outdoor pool, but, but, but we're starting to see, you know, you know, you know, I wouldn't say masses of all, but one of the concerns I would have as a, as a light plant portion is that, you know, the rate pays are going to borrow the cost without assistance because, you know, we're, we're a small base versus, you know, national or episodes where they pa- pass on the EV mm-hmm. and solar charge. So that's, that's a concern I would have for like the MLPs, yep. you know, the rate pays, you know, for the cost of it. And I know we're in Cohasset, I get it, but I have, while you're here, I figure why not? <laughs> no, I, it's, it's, your point is so incredibly well taken. And one of the things that, um, You'll notice that the governor, when we've been, we were talking about passage of the bill and there was the negotiations going back and forth, you know, he was talking about costs and he was talking about low income and how would people afford these things. I mean, that was that was something we built, baked it right into the legislation that they must take that into account. And so there's actually some really nice um, pieces out there that look at um, how do you get it, say energy efficiency in apartment buildings and and pass that on to rate pay you know onto the renters and make sure that they're gleaning the savings 
And because it's a complicated question and we could just do carbon pricing like that tomorrow, but you know, and we may yet, but part of it, um, but it's really understanding that the dynamic you're talking about, because at the end of the day, the rate, one way or the other, the rate payers are the ones that bear the cost. So we have to be doing it in a thoughtful, incremental way so that it, the burden just doesn't come crashing down on everybody and that it's really spread out over the 30 years of planning um, and that we're looking ahead to it. So it's meant to be very much um, integrated, which was not happening before. So I don't know the actual answer to your question, yep. but I think you're asking the exact right question. And that was that was the whole reason we wrote the bill the way we did. And I actually have great faith in us to be able to. And I do have one more, one more question, I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, so like, you know, Arab, you know, we do have a lot of, we have 80 customers in Hangham Wood Solar, mm -hmm. which is not much out of about 10,500 10, base customer. Yeah. But, you know, it's kind of similar like Hull, but right now the SMART program it expires June 30th. Yep. And in a lot of concerns amongst, you know, you know, your, your folks for Hull and Hangham that, that it's not, there's no incentives anymore. Like the, at the SREC program was, was the bomb. Everybody loved right. it. Yep. So I was consider looking at that because I think people really want it and the mm -hmm. deadlines, it's, it's over. So I, I will share with you, not that the committee, um, I sit, I'm a member on telecom utility and energy. And so one of the functions was oversight for um, the new regulations that came out both for the SRECs um, and then also for um, renewables. So we did the first piece and I'll share with, um, um, I'll, or just if you email me, I'll, I'll email you the report that um, we sent back to, um, to um, EEA. And what we told them was that we thought that they should um, see their SREC program through. Um, we understood uh, why they were tr transitioning and that we, we agreed that we thought it was okay to start the new program but that they had made a commitment that people um, that took them at their word, they made their own personal investments, especially, you know, businesses, I think, recouped much quicker on the SREC program than, say, a regular person on their home. Um, right. And I'm trying to think of his name from Hingham that gave really great testimony. Um, oh, my God. Uh, uh, Ber Berger? No. John Berger? J uh, no. Roger um, Freeman. Yes, Roger Freeman. He gave excellent testimony um, to the committee, and then he did actually. I urged him to send it in, and we adopted what he said and recommended it. So all we can do as a as an oversight committee is is tell them that we we feel that they need to honor their commitment to individuals. Who else will take them at their word then, if if they're going to blow off um, you know this commitment early? So, I mean, regular people need to be able to, to trust that if they're early adopters, that they'll see it through. So we did do that piece of it and I'd be happy to share the, the committee's report with you if you if you just, I'll forget. If you if you email me, then I'll remember. That's fine. I'll email you after this. I have your yeah. email. Yeah. Um, but that, yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. And, you know, I think the committee understood um, it was a good dialogue and the committee really understood that, you know, they have to evolve and change and that, you know, as you move from early adopters into sort of more um, implementation plans, that that's gonna happen. But we, we all basically agree they, they really just needed to honor their original commitment on that. So I'll throw my email in the chat. Um, I'll see if I can do it. Here we go. Yeah. Steve, don't you wanna ask, when are we gonna get the uh, approval of our community aggregation plan? <laughs> I did actually ask that question. So Steve has been a very good committee member and he was talking to me um, about, uh, about the sort of the hiatus. And uh, so I did um, speak to uh, the commissioner and to the director um, and they have, um, they have resumed, they have resumed the hearings. And I think there were kind of a couple of things that were going on um, with with Cohasset's application and it was really just timing and procedural and what basically happened was when they first put them out they were sort of 
doing it quickly. And what happened was from those first from those first applications, they really did learn a lot about how to develop the programs, how to make them um, efficacious, but also how to look at it from a consumer protection perspective. And so the next sort of batch of things that came in, they were being much more um, sort of deliberative and inquiring more from to ensure that consumer protection piece. Um, so you, you came in after they had sort of learned some life lessons. And so now they're, which is good, right? Because they're looking at your application in a much more sort of with a more weathered eye and an eye towards cons consumer protection. Um, and then unfortunately COVID hit and everyone sort of suspended, but um, I have been completely reassured that, um, that your application is pending, um, that there is active um, sort of um, communication between DPU and the town. Um, and I am told that you are very, very ably represented um, and that your um, attorneys are doing a, a terrific job and that, um, that there's been very good communication back and forth. So um, I feel like, so I was, I felt confident that, um, and I did check with Chris senior, um, I did feel confident that um, everything was going as, as it would and that uh, it would have a good, um, that it would have a good outcome for you. So um, obviously I, I, you know, you're represented by counsel, so I couldn't inquire, ask any specific details. Uh, I could only just really make sure that it was being actively considered and that it was moving along. And it, it sounds like it was. So, um, but if for any reason you feel like it's gone into a black hole, just call and I'm, I'm happy to call again. And, and thank you. And, and thank you, Steve, for pushing that. I just, I want to welcome our newest select person in Cohasset. Jean Healy Dipple. Jean, welcome. Um, glad that you're here. Do you want to just do a quick hello and introduction? Sure. Hi, and, and I apologize for being late. I was working on a homework assignment that had to be done, but I didn't want to miss out. Um, so thanks, Tanya. I appreciate the welcome. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing more and um, seeing the replay of you too, Joan, as well but I know you have a packed agenda. So thanks for letting me do the welcome. So, Representative Mishino, Mich thank you so much for coming again. We've kept you here for an hour almost and we appreciate all of your time and, and advocacy and understanding all politics is local so that these efforts have to happen on the local level. And we are blessed with such a great committee that is knowledgeable and active and able to take advantage of these policies that you're putting into place. So thank you very much for explaining to us what this new legislation entails and we look forward to helping to implement it as, uh, as you desire on our end. Oh, absolutely. And just remember, my lens is the district and it's the work that you do at the local level um, that inspired me to pursue the legislation that I've been filing on climate. So uh, it's, it's all thanks to your great work. And I'm happy to come anytime. Great, thank you. Could everybody take yourself off of mute and do a little round of applause. Thank you so much again. Um, we look forward to communications and, and making this happen. So we appreciate all of your efforts and some of your exciting bills. So hopefully they'll turn into law. Excellent, thank you. Great, and Jean, it's so great to have you here. So we are about to jump into our 2020-2021 um, initiatives, but first Brianna is gonna give us an update on our EV charging stations. Um, as you know, and I, hopefully you guys got to see the fun kitschy um, video that she did talking about them. If not, I would play it. Um, because it's so cute and I love it. Uh, we have five places in town where we have charging stations. They're currently free. There's a total of 18 ports and the downtown one is very much about economic development. We have them at school, the um, rec center, uh, as well as the uh, library and we're just, we're thrilled to have those. And so we're monitoring and keeping track of how many new cars are coming in and charging. 
And Brianna, do you have that report to share with us? And then do you want to show the video while you're sharing your screen? Because we didn't get to play it last time and I want it recorded on one of our meetings because it is so darn cute. Sure. Okay. I didn't realize it didn't play last time. I will definitely pull it up. Um, and just so you all know, it's linked on the AEC webpage as well as the EV ceremony that we did before we took the pictures that we put into the video. Um, so the data for the charging stations is really good for the month of May. Um, we had the most unique drivers that we've recorded so far. There were 42 unique drivers, um, whereas in April it was only 30. It was 29 in March and it was only 14 in February. So it's continued to grow um, and it's like this is a pretty dramatic increase. Um, there were 141 individual charging sessions in the month of May and that's higher than 121 sessions from the month of April. Um, the EV charging has avoided 8,145 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions so far. I love giving this statistic because the number keeps going up. Um, that's equivalent to planting 209 trees and letting them grow for 10 years. Um, I don't, even if we had a tree planting day in Cohasset, I'm not sure we could reach 200 trees planted. So that's, that's really wonderful. Um, and then the energy cost to the town is increasing though. So I just want the committee to be aware because we've kind of gotten some, some um, acknowledgements of that in other, other settings. Uh, I know that like select board members and, and different committees have kind of brought it up. Like what is this cost to the town? Um, so in the last 30 days, at setting our rate at about 12 cents per kilowatt hour, which is total average estimate, the town it, we've used 1.79 megawatts of electricity that the town has expended to allow these vehicles to charge in 141 sessions. Um, but that comes to about $215 in the last 30 days. So it's something for just the committee to be thinking about, you know, if someone wants to step in and help figure out an appropriate price point um, or when we think it's appropriate to set a price. Um, you know, should we wait until the end of the summer or the end of the year to allow people to get into the stations? Just, just the things to think about uh, as more people use them and we're really excited about it. You know, we also want to make sure that the town is um, adjusting accordingly. So that's that's my update on it. I can pull up the video uh, and play it. I can wait until later in the meeting if you'd like um, or we could do it now. No, let's do it now and then we'll move on to the initiatives. Okay, let me and I want to commend Brianna for just a great, a great ceremony and then doing this on her own initiative, because I think it's just something that we've got to get marketing. Brianna, did you have the number of consumption in kilowatt hours for the month of May from the charges themselves? Uh, yes, it's. Well, I have it for the last 30 days. So for some reason, this one statistic is in the past 30 days. Um, I can I can go back and check and email it to you. Um, but I know it's in the megawatt hours, 1.79. So in kilowatt hours, it's uh, time. Take away two, take away two zeros. Yeah. 1,790. Yes. yes. Thank you. Add two zeros. 100,000. So... Yes, I'm just pulling up the AEC website right now. Tanya and Brianna, if you, if you want to set the rate at some point, I'll help you figure out the rate structure. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I know that we've brainstormed it, but it's, thank you. Yeah, just reach out to me. So I have the video here. I'm going to share it. Okay. Can you all see that? Yep. Okay.
I'm Corey Evans. I'm a member of the Cohasset Select Board and I'm on the Cohasset Economic Task Force. And one of the things we're working on is trying to get more people downtown to go to restaurants and go shopping. So one thing you should be aware of if you drive an electric car, we have two or four electric car charging spots here and now. So please come downtown, get dinner, do some shopping, get a top off. Right now there are no charge. Top off, get some dinner, have a good walk, and enjoy. So that's the video. I don't know if you could actually hear the music. I realized halfway through that Zoom tends to mute audio that does not that comes through as music and not speaking. Um, so if you couldn't hear the music, you probably thought it was a really long slideshow. Um, and I encourage you to go and actually watch the video. It's just a fun thing. I think it gets everybody in a good mood about electric vehicles. So have we um, sent it to Cohasset 143? to play or on um, our cable? Yes. Because if they've got like three minutes to fill, they can pop that in. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Well, thank you again, Brianna. Um, are there any questions on electric vehicles for Brianna before we move to the um, updates? Okay. So let's try to do this quickly because I know we're already one hour in. Um, update on 2021 initiatives. So Go Electric, formerly referred to as Electrify Everything and Solarize Plus, and we have here with us in their citizen capacity, giving us a report to this committee who's been tasked to find out more information, De Debbie Cook. Debbie, do you wanna give us an update? Yeah, um, basically, we're really we're concentrating on getting the website, um, you know, populated with information and well, first of all, all laid out and populated with information. So a subcommittee has been working on that. And we feel like we can't really push forward and go out and talk to vendors and everything unless we've got something really concrete to show them because that's what's going to showcase their offers. So we're moving very diligently on that, but um, then, then once that's done, we're going to last out. Okay, great. Uh, town hall renovation. Brianna, do you want to give us an update on that? I know there's been money approved at town meeting. Yes. Um, just give me one second. So this is for the town hall renovation, you said? Um, I don't know the exact amount. I do know that it was approved to move forward and it's still in study phases. So it wasn't the actual building. That was 
um, it was, or I don't know if a million, but like the several million dollars. Um, it was, I believe, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars approximately that was approved, so they could continue to study and research and move forward in the plans. Um, and then while you're on, do you want to give us an update on grants? Yes. Um, so we, so Michelle applied for the maximum assistance under the MAPC technical assistance grant. It's for fiscal year 2022. Um, it's a regional energy planning assistance program and it varies in types of assistance, but none of them had a dollar value listed. So we applied for every category, including you know battery storage, net zero planning for future sustainability. Um, they give priority to communities trying to become green communities, but they also have community tax assistance. Uh, uh, Energy planning, and as I said, which is a new category here, um, and we don't have net zero buildings in Cohasset yet, but they're they're thinking about that, so we might be able to use this grant money to move forward with net zero buildings. Um, and that's that's my update on the grants. So we've applied for an MAPC grant that we're hoping to hear back on within the next year. I don't know when they the decisions come out, but I do know it was just due yesterday or two days ago. Questions on grants. And we have to start writing, putting pen to paper on the BRIC grant. But I think we're in a good shape, especially once we get the mass CEC study. I have a quick question about grants. I know we were talking about the grant to slide it forward from 2025 related to the roofs of the schools. Is that incorporated in the filing that you guys made? I don't believe so, not in this grant. Okay. I will also say that um, the, so I, I now understand this timing of the roofs and why it keeps shifting. Basically, there were a lot of school roofs in Massachusetts that were replaced around the same time as us with the same funding. And so in order to be able to better allocate the money, the, the state is changing the date at which you, you know, 20 years, 25 years, 28 years, at which you could apply and this year although they said feel free to apply there are no you know limits in fact they did come out and they had date limits that would preclude us from applying for a hastened accelerated roof replacement so we are still in three to eight years out for our school roofs which is so frustrating it's like who's moving my cheese but without so does that mean <laughs> does that mean we go to the school committee with the carports we have gone to the school committee with the carports. Amoresco has presented to them twice. Uh, there's a pretty big reluctance on that. But um, we had also told them that we were looking at the school roofs and would have a more definitive piece of information um, soon. And so we're going to have to go back and let them know that we are not going to be able to get anything accelerated in this, this year. And then let them take a vote. And they can decide. Cool. Um, now, the other thing is we do have our third party sites are still viable. I have asked. Uh, they gave us, Scott and um, Palmer Capital gave us a blended rate for both roof and carports. But clearly the roofs are more cost effective. So I asked them to give us a price for just the roofs. Um, and they're reluctant to do that. Keep in mind, we don't have to go through an RFP process for third-party sites. They could just send us a contract and, and we could, the town manager could sign it tomorrow. So we're, we're just, they're still working through the lease payments and the pricing and we're just trying to get the best price possible for uh, the town. Okay. And, and on the town meeting warrant, since we're now on the solar energy arrays, uh, that was deferred indefinitely. Um, you can't take it off the warrant once it's on. So it was deferred indefinitely because we did not receive any traction from the review that Select Energy had done. We were hoping they'd be able to say they could do something there, but there were too many issues associated with the land around the water uh, plant tied to wetlands and recreational trails and, and uh, topography that made it difficult to do ground mount. 
Tanya, so Jason and I, as done a look at the uh, floating solar arrays or a PICA for, you know, to participate in the ISO New England market. So, so would that affect that warrant being put up? Would that affect us? No, because we can, you can move forward with looking at whatever you want um, because select, it, we're working with select, we could do it without town approval for the lease through the municipal consortium. There is a backdoor way to get it, or we could take it to town meeting for approval once we have a very clearly laid out plan. Um, okay. The problem was we didn't have a plan and it just, I, it seemed like we would be expending political capital for potentially nothing. So we're really looking at that floating solar because of the, the prevent the algae growth and keeping the water clean. So that's great. And, and I think if there are benefits like that, the town will be more amenable to it, even with the view changing. Yeah. And we're just trying to find, you know, we'll talk to Scott. We're just trying to find somebody. I mean, there's, there's not many people in the United States have done it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But, um, we were, we're actively look. I've been looking as well, you know. So it'd be a, it'd be a, it'd be a portion of uh, Lily Pond. Right. Right. Good. Okay. Community solar. I don't think there's been any um, movement on that other than Amoresco was able to do community solar and Steve was able to get information from them. If we want to have somebody from a town who has done community solar, come talk to us about that. We can do that. Um, community solar might be a very good play for the MBTA station. But that's just something, as long as Amoresco's um, business model is the town takes half of the energy under contract and then they're open to selling to um, other parties, the rest of it. Just that first half gets them the financing. Steve, is there, am, am I mistaken? Is there anything more for us to report on community solar? I have nothing new on community solar. Okay, good. That's a good summary of the current state. Okay, um, electric buses. Last meeting, this committee voted to establish an electric bus committee. This would be a committee that does the research to understand what the options are there are speakers to bring in on electric buses and we already have one. They would help to arrange that and then would work with capital budget and um, the town manager to and the staff to understand what the different alternatives is and the cost and benefits of going with electric buses. Keep in mind the lease is up in two years, they're three year leases and this, the buses are, uh, the lease is up in two years uh, we probably could get money to help subsidize whatever the incremental cost is, and we could put that into a BRIC grant, uh, especially if it ties into what the Mass CEC has done. So we did establish the committee, but we did not take volunteers. So um, what I would ask at this point is uh, who I would say we need to have two to three people. So if you're not actively working on anything else right now, I would encourage you to join this committee um, just so that we can, you know, have a 100% active participation rate. But uh, I am happy to be on this committee. And I don't know if there's anybody else who'd like to be on this committee as well. Well, if you need help on the side with, with National Grid, I'll help you out. Okay, awesome. Tyler, how about you? I know microgrids are pretty slow right now. Would you have time? Yeah, I can jump on that one. I was looking at the next agenda item, the electric municipal municipalization. Is that a committee uh, as well or? We do not have a committee yet for that. So that's, we're gonna ask whether or not we want to do a committee. Okay. So if that affects your decision, you can, I won't um, press you. We can hold on that. Okay. I'd be more interested in that one. I think I would provide more um, benefit to that one, but. Okay, good. 
Okay, so Steve, why don't you and I start taking the lead, and then as we move on, I'll see if either Pat or if Pat could join us. I know she's been involved with the uh, Go Electric, but maybe that's something that she'd be interested in. And Corey Evans on the select board 100% supports this. So it might be something that we try to communicate with him, sort of have him be our liaison from the um, select board. I already told you, I, I talked to Manny already. He told yep. me where to look in town. Oh, he did. Oh, yeah. So I already looked. I, I picked out about six spots in town. Okay. So Good. Once, talk, Good. once we start talking about it, we'll just give it to him for like the high level look. Yep. Okay. Excellent. And I think that there may be something coming out with our mass CEC microgrid study with respect to mobile storage. Um, and we have asked them to look at school buses as well as other mobile storage opportunities for the DPW site to take advantage of our existing solar when we have outages. And again, this is something that definitely we can include for grants. Okay, so we've got myself and Steve so far, and I'll ask Pat if she wants to participate on this. Um, and, and Tyler is earmarked and I'll also talk to Mike, but he also might want to be on the electric municipalization. So, well, or maybe not actually, since he's uh, ever source. Okay, so that's electric buses. Um, on the electric municipalization, with the town's approval of the budget, there is money in there to examine this topic to hire a consultant to help us think through whether or not it makes sense for the town to become its own municipality. And to do that, we'd have to purchase the distribution lines from National Grid. But if we wanted to put on solar, if we wanted to connect, we could do that. Um, there still could be costs up, upstream, um, which I don't understand how that works. For example, the school roofs came in with a estimated cost of like $500,000 to upgrade uh, a, a substation in Norwood. So we are gonna talk to National Grid and understand why solar panels in Cohasset would require an upgrade at Norwell, but that is what they came up with. So electric municipalization would give us more degrees of freedom. It also comes with risk and it comes with costs and it would require a whole, um, effort, even if it's outsourced, to be able to manage the electric municipalization. But it is something that is of interest. We've been tasked with pursuing. We haven't had the funding to do that. We now have the funding to go forward with hiring a consultant. So this committee, if we are to establish a committee, would um, basically initially take responsibility for uh, putting out the request for proposal and choosing the consultant and managing the process. So is that something people feel we should establish an official committee for? Or is there another approach we think we should take? Yeah, I think we should definitely establish a committee for that. If, if um, you know, if the town is, I guess, giving us a direction that we can pursue that, I think that definitely makes sense especially since we have Hingham and Hull right next door already. You know, if there was no municipalities around us, you know, that'd be a little different. But, you know, I think, um, I think it'd be a benefit to the town. Um, one thing to note there... as well. Oh, go for go it, ahead, Steve. Ahead, Steve. Nope, it was Adam. Um, really quick. So if we do become a municipal, as Steve had mentioned at the beginning, in terms of the incentives related to the solar programs, we would no longer be eligible for SMART because the Mass District 1 and Mass District 2 are obviously closed. So if we were to install solar panels, those incentives in the SMART program, we would no longer be able to apply for. Is that correct? That is correct. And what we don't know, but this committee would need to understand is what happens to the existing solar energy array, which was implemented under a state program that was not offered to municipal light companies. But that was the SMART 2, or sorry, the SRAC 2 program, which was eligible for Hingham residents. So that's fine because the landfill is still a mass SRAC 2. 
So I think, but these are the questions that the committee would need to answer and yeah. explore. And, and at the end, the committee would have a cost benefit analysis. The consultant would help them develop the cost benefit analysis, but there'd be, I, I'd imagine a cost benefit analysis, which then is presented to the select board. And I don't know if it then has to go to vote for an enterprise fund or how, you know, but there's, there's a lot of steps here. It's just, this is the first step. Yeah. Could I ask, is, is, is part of the scope, is there any, is there any interest or is it possible to actually join Hingham or Hull's, um, you know, system? I mean, Steve, I, Giardi, no. no, I, I mean, Steve, Steve can confirm, but the rules are a municipal light company cannot deliver electricity over the border to another municipality unless they become a cooperative. But Steve, you might have more specific. You, you, just, you, just, you just said it, you know, you, you'd have to become a cooperative. And then there's a thing of, of capacity. I was talking to Joan about capacity. You know, uh, we were, we're only limited to so much capacity and we have to serve our own customers first. And, you know, in Hull, you know, they're, you know, Hull is on two lines that are, older than probably five of us put together. And, you know, it's, there would have to be a lot of consideration, I think. Actually, the, the general manager of Hingham Light was just on, he just left. <laughs> but you can't, you can't cross, you know, territories like that. But there are benefits being a light plant. You do have local control. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a benefit. You can figure out about the solar initiatives. You would have to actually have control of your, the, the people would have control of their of their system, you know, which is a good thing. You have a voice. You're not just one person and dot a, a national grid. So anyway, yeah, again, it, these are questions I think for the committee to address. We don't need to get into the details here. So it sounds like there's interest in pursuing it. We've been tasked with pursuing it. There's funding to hire a consultant to help us um, do is there a motion to establish a committee, a subcommittee of the Alternative Energy Committee to focus on electric municipalization? A motion that. Okay, thanks, Tyler. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, let's take a vote. It has to be a roll call vote. I'll start Tanya Bodell, aye. Debbie Cook, aye. Tyler Tebow, aye. Adam Amen, aye. Steve Winter, I'm going to abstain. Okay. All right. So it has passed for with one abstention. Um, let's put that into the record, and we've established that now. Tyler, you've already indicated that you're interested in participating on this. Can yeah, we, um, let's have you right now, it's not that you have to be the chair, but we'll have you take the lead. Is there anybody else on this call who'd like to participate on that? Um, and these subcommittees, by the way, can have people who are not on our committee participate. So I think that we should think about recruiting for like electric vehicles and municipalization outside of this committee to try to get a broader reach of representation for the town, especially on this one, which could be very controversial. Um, I just want to add to please throw me on all emails about everything so I can help in any way I can, especially because I work for you all. So just yes. <laughs> And I do, trust me. <laughs> BB and it pops up. Tanya, do they have to be Cohasa residents? Um, I don't know. I don't. I will look into that and find out. If, if you can make can, that an action item, Debbie. If you could look into that, I'm sure I know Tyler's got a lot of weapons. I know I got a lot of weapons outside of Cohasa, and I know Mike does too. <laughs> Yeah, Mike might want to also be on this committee, and that might be why he held off on the electric vehicle committee. Um, Jeannie, did you have a question? Yeah, I did have a quick question. Um, 
is this in order to become independent and have your own light plant is this going to be similar to um, what Hingham had to do with Aquarian in terms of uh, yes okay I yes. thought so and you know that was obviously a rigorous process but not unreasonable in terms of you know the cost benefit and um and I suppose before prejudging anything, I would just say on my end, there's interest. I think that having done a lot of just talking to people, including door knocking and just, um, there's a lot of frustration with national grid. In interest in green energy too. So to align the two, you know, you might just get enough, but this is also a town that is always very cost conscious. So there's, you know, competing things going on. Yeah. Is that frustration related to power outages or is it related to prices? Because power I don't think outages. Po power outages aren't necessarily going to improve if we become a municipality just because we don't have enough generation. Yeah. Well, so I think that is going to be a, a question then because people are going to expect less power outages if we're saying we're taking it over and trying to figure out how to navigate that I think will be important. We could have more control over restoration though. You know, right now we're, you know, we're kind of like a dead end, right? So by the yeah. time the crews get out to our outages, you know, it may take a while longer or if we're running it, you know, we can hire the contract crews to be on standby and, and hopefully repair power quicker. That is one benefit. I mean, Steve yeah. you probably can, Agree with that, right? Or a hundred, hundred percent. You know the storms. You know, just be honest, Adam. Like you know, being a municipal light plan. You know, you know, Gene's for, for hanging with father was just like when they, he knows the the outage times are, are crazy quick, and everybody went to hang them during all these storms. Like I couldn't even get the stars. I was so hungry. I'll never forget one of those March storms. <laughs> So, That's where I go. I got to hang them. <laughs> right. So, you know, at the end of the day, there's is huge. And the biggest thing is a better position, though. And you guys have more feeder lines. It's, it's not that. It's hard to compare, right? So, so this is a quick analogy. It's not. Nice. The, uh, the, the, oh, geez, what's it? Um, I'll draw a blank. The, the, um, the situated side feeder has a better reliability than Nowell because this is, there's a small mini substation in situated. So having a substation in town that serves Cohasset is a major upgrade because you can actually take this time. I even drew it out. You can have four feeders in, in this town, all the same voltages. That's how Hingham does it. We just divert power all the way around until we can pocket it nicely and out of I mean, I've seen trees take down six poles and we only get like 50 people out because we can switch around the power. Yeah. So there's, a there's technology today that National Grid will never invest on our system. And we can put smart technology to help to mitigate some of this. We have the second worst resiliency rate from National Grid on our feeder line. Second worst in the time it takes to get it back up and running. Steve. Does anybody know what would happen to our aggregation program if Cohasset became a muni? That would be one of the things that we would look into. That's what the committee would have to explore. Uh, okay. Anything else on, I think we. this is good. We've got the committee. We've got um, Tyler as a start. We Tyler, feel free to recruit other people you know, including Mike. Um, but I think we should also think about recruiting outside of our committee to get a broader representation that has been very successful for us in some of our other initiatives. So I think we should just keep to the same recipe if you agree. Okay, um, updates on 2020 initiatives. So I think we've already given the solar energy RFP update. We are still, I don't wanna say striking out, but um, we are not, you know, the roofs are a non-starter. The water plant is a non-starter. The carports at the schools, we have to get a vote from them on what they want to do uh, from the school committee on what they want to do, but it doesn't look good, but maybe that would change um, as the school committee composition changes. We'll see. 
Um, but Amoresco, Select has, uh, Select and Amoresco have put us in the queue. Um, Palmer has a third party sites ready to go, but we're trying to see if we can focus on the roofs, which would be the more cost effective for us. And they've been, uh, we've asked them to look at expanding the existing site and they are um, having a lot of inverter issues. And so they're trying to figure out what's going on with that. So that's the update on solar energy. Any questions? Hey, Tanya, just to weigh in real quick. Um, part of the reason why I was a little bit late was that um, we did school facility interviews. So we're constituting the committee and we haven't decided yet, but I, it occurred to me, maybe it's important for this committee to have some input with those folks to make sure as, as they go through the needs analysis on all of the potential in terms of what can happen with those schools that you have input there. Um, okay, great. I mean, that's a long range project, but for sure. Thank you, Jane. Tanya, I'm just uh, curious, uh, do we have any um, estimate from uh, Palmer as to when they'll understand their inverter issues at the uh, solar array? Oh, so, I mean, unfortunately, I think in their mind, the easier target is the third party sites. And so they're really focused on those. Um, and I don't understand why the inverters are having issues because the national grid hosting capacity um, indicates that there's plenty of capacity on that line. And frankly, the same thing with the school line. So it was shocking to find out from Select Energy that national grid tagged a $500,000 charge to upgrade their system at Norwell if we wanted to put in solar on the school roofs. $500,000? $500,000. I think I think you might have been lied to. That's Do you have documentation? We're going to call National Grid directly and find out what's going on. Because I'll, again... I'll, I'll ask Manny. Okay. Because that's, that's great. Actually, that would be great. So, because we want to definitely understand what is going on. Because if that's going to be a charge for the school roofs, it's going to be a charge for the school carports. And it's going to be a charge for anything we do. It's not Jesus. just. What's the he size? Was, solar was that there. Oh, that's crazy money. Yeah, what, <laughs> what size? What's the size solar that would go on the roof? That's one megawatt in total. Less than a megawatt. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know it all works. Where it's like you're in a, you know, you're essentially in a queue, and you could be the one to trigger the upgrades needed, but that just seems a little ridiculous. Um, it doesn't make sense it, it, to me. It, is, it, it was unbelievable. I mean, when I say unbelievable, like there is nothing that I can think of that would support that number. And I pressed, Brianna knows, I pressed the representative from Select. I said, the hosting capacity map says there's plenty of capacity. We're putting on solar, which is an offset to our load. It's not like we're going to be pushing anything back into the system because our lowest point of um, consumption is one megawatt. And whatever incremental production would occur is not going to be pushing anything back into the system. So Oof. there just there was nothing that made sense to me. And I said we would talk to National Grid. So, Steve, if that could be your action item, Debbie, if you could note that. Steve is going to talk to National Grid to understand why it would cost so much for us to upgrade, uh, for us to um, put in solar. Brianna. I will also say that I've been trying to set up a meeting with um, Dennis from National Grid for a couple of weeks now. And so in the next two weeks, we'll hopefully get a meeting with him too to discuss the interconnection costs. Um, and he's reaching out to another colleague at National Grid. Um, but to have Steve... Steve, you should still reach out to Manny because I don't, we shouldn't have to wait the, the two. It's been yeah, taking you know, you, you have to go to people like Tyler. You got to go right to the. Who's Manny? What? Who's, who's, who's Manny? Emmanuel. I, I always forget his last. Sedalea. He actually friended me on LinkedIn like three months ago. 
for no, nobody. Is he like an account executive or something? For no, he's for, the local engineer for Cohasa and Noel oh. in a piece of situate. I mean, usually like these big, like if they're requesting like a big like station upgrade, that's going to be like in our, you know, I'm distribution engineering. And then there's this whole like system planning, DER planning group. And they're the ones that would call to, you know, for these big upgrades like that. So that's probably who we got to get to. But we must have a um, a rep, right, that covers Cohasset from National Grid. That's who Dennis is. Okay. All right. Let me... Is it, so let's I'd like to try to reason. join that meeting if possible when you set that up. Okay. Yeah. Is that information able to be shared with the committee here to see exactly how that $500,000 is being broken down or was it just communicated from select? But did he send us, he sent us, he did send us, didn't he, Brianna? Did he send us the um, written estimate? I had asked for it. I'm not positive. Um, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll find out. All, when we get the meeting set up, does everyone in this committee want to be invited to the meeting? Is that allowed? Or that no, can't if we do that, if we do that, it has to be a committee meeting. Okay. You yeah. have to put it out an agenda. So I'd prefer to keep it no quorum. So that would mean only two other people besides myself could attend. Steve can attend because he's not a committee member. And that wouldn't be an issue. So I would say Tyler, myself, Mike, unless somebody's dying to understand this, but I prefer to get the electrical engineers on this and challenge. It just it does not make sense to me. That's a station transformer. That's that's a so that's a lot of money. Yeah, I'd be interested to see exactly what the upgrades are that they're requesting. Yeah. Tyler, I bet your lunch, it's a, it was low. It was a lie. <laughs> <laughs> You're being recorded. So oh, um, we'll, we'll, um, we'll, but I, I did indicate I didn't believe it. And we're going to, we, we're going to talk to National Grid directly. All right. So that's a solar energy RP microgrid study. We haven't gotten it yet, but I think it should be coming soon. Brianna, do you have anything on that? Yeah, I haven't heard back from them that the initial schedule says that we should be getting it in July at the latest. So unless there's some significant delay they haven't told us about, we should be getting it within the next about a, a month or in a couple weeks. Um, but I also expect they'll be reaching out probably soon to set up an update meeting if that's not the case. So we'll definitely know where we stand at the next AEC meeting. Um, the last place we left it is probably the same information you had at the last meeting that, um, you know, they're leaning towards mobile storage as the most viable thing. Um, and when in doubt where we do want to pursue a microgrid, the best case scenario for all the different sites they looked at, even though those specific sites, the DPW and the police fire department weren't going to work, um, they, it always came out to the same results that using our existing diesel generators, um, installing new PV arrays, and maybe battery storage, especially if we can swing a grant, would be the best case scenario. Um, so when in doubt, that's like a structure we should pursue. Um, but the, the sites they were looking at weren't working. So it's probably going to end up being mobile storage as, the, as what they recommend. Okay, well, that's good. We'll see. And that, then we can use that for a brick grant if, if we think it makes sense. Uh, thanks for the update on that. Uh, data initiatives. Uh, this should be short, but I just want Brianna to give us an update on all of her efforts, which keep striking out through no fault of her own. Yeah, I, I can tell you about all the things, um, but there we are pursuing this data to the fullest extent. Um, we have not gotten it. It's... Um, no, uh, but I did reach out to the treasurer's office and I've been in conversations with them. I went in person a few weeks ago and they were like, we don't have that. Um, but I reached out and um, the the main person in the office was kind of looking back and forth for me. Um, so we've been in communications and I think I'm going to try to reach out to the RMV again and just see if they've had any um, developments, especially with their EV hub and communications with Massachusetts and getting this data. Um, I spoke with Jake Valencourt. I don't know if I said this at a previous meeting, um, 
I think it was in the past several weeks I spoke with him about the, the data initiative because he's doing the same thing for Hull. And he said that um, it, the only way we're going to get this data is if we push for legislation that requires it, the data to be recorded in a new way. Um, so that's, yeah, it might require a policy change, um, but we'll see. We're working on it. So that's the update. <laughs> You know, the other thing is, Brianna, if you can talk to Chris Sr., because I know for a fact that this data is included on the form that everybody receives and sends back. So it's some it's someplace. Somebody has it. When I get my little form, it says what kind of car I have. And it gives the license plate. And the treasurer so sends you the form? I get I receive the form from the town. And it's a, and it has the two different cars and the value and the tax. Okay, I, I I guess part of the problem is I have never paid taxes. Do you think you could send me a copy of the form and I yeah. could look at it and see? Okay. Yeah, okay. I can do that. Is this it's the Cohasset treasurer you're talking I'm about? I'm sorry. Is this the Cohasset treasurer yeah. that you're trying to get data from? Okay. So wouldn't it make sense? Yeah. I mean, the excise taxes are those those are public. They tell exactly what make and model everything is. Everyone's excise taxes. That's what we're trying to get. And and everybody keeps telling Brianna it doesn't exist. So Brianna, I'm gonna send you, I can't do it now, but when I get home, I'll send you a copy of um, the excise tax that I received. Or if anybody else has your excise tax handy, which identifies your car, make and vehicle model, send a copy to just take a picture with your phone and send a copy to Brianna and copy me. And then Brianna take that to the treasurer and say, who is printing this out and collecting this money? Because this is someplace. This doesn't just come out of thin air. It's in somebody's system. I will. That's okay. And, and then if they don't give it to us, we're going to do a FOIA request. I mean, it's stupid that a committee would have to do a FOIA request, but we know for a fact it's someplace. Like that comes out of the collector's office. I mean, they run those things. They're the, and it's not, it's public information. It's the treasurer collector's office, exactly, which is where Chris Sr. told us we should go. We went to the appraiser's office. They don't do it, but the treasurer collector's office issues these. So it's got to be in the system someplace. And they initially tried to tell me it was all coming from the assessor's office, so I should speak with them. But when I spoke with them, they didn't have that data as well. So it's, um, yeah, and that comes from the RMV. And the RMV told me they don't have the data. And they, they kind of did in the website, but it's designed in a way that you can't get data dumps and you can't look up everything at once. You'd have to look up every individual in, in the town. And I don't know every individual in the town, so... <laughs> Like, I know it exists um, because they couldn't print it out if it didn't exist. So just, I think, once you get your picture um, of the excise tax that shows this, take it back to the treasurer collector and says, who prints this? You also might want to send that to our IT guy, Rob, and find out if he's helping them to print it. I don't think he is. I think it's a legacy system that they're using for the excise tax, but he might be involved or he might be able to go get the data in its raw form wherever it is. Okay. Okay. So it just may be that the treasure collector pushes a button. The data comes in from the RMV. They push a button. It prints it out. And, and that's how it goes. But that means the data is someplace. So just because they don't have a GUI interface to get to it doesn't mean our IT guy can't do that. So we'll, we'll get you an example. And I know it exists. So well, thank you for all your effort. And I'm sorry, it's so frustrating. Can I just say, you know, I mean, the, the tax collector has to, you know, has to know the, the make and model to know that you've act adequately paid your taxes. I mean, they, you know, you pay to the town of Coasset on that excise bill. So they yeah. have to know exactly the content of it. I was told they, they only receive a, an amount I believe from the RMV, which which is why I'm going to contact the RMV again because then maybe they have that list. Um, I don't know why our treasurer collector doesn't know the models. Um, but, but 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 Brianna, that is not. This is what. As soon as we send you a picture of the excise of the excise tax, you'll see it has the make and model, or it has information 
that justifies the price. So yeah. it's someplace. So Tanya, can I just ask, what exactly are you looking for? The make and model of every vehicle in Cohasset? Yeah, what we're trying to get a feel for is start tracking the electric vehicles that are in town. It is our hypothesis that we, uh, just given the demographics and given the number of Priuses and Teslas that are driving around, that we are a cluster, an electric vehicle cluster. We are the demographic that's going to be early adopters and that are going to start purchasing electric vehicles more quickly. And that creates a couple of issues. One is potential reliability issues related to, you know, from a reliability resiliency if people are depending on electricity to charge their cars and we are getting outages every month, that is a problem. The second is understanding what kind of infrastructure we as a town want to promote and um, possibly even pay for so that there is there are places to charge. And then the third is to understand if we could potentially use those assets uh, either directly at the house or in a centralized town parking facility or other as backup storage for the community. And that's a futuristic type of approach. But we want to start tracking. We want to understand. I'm sorry. Can you make model and date then? We just, we'd like to, all we need to know is it is, is it an electric vehicle or not? But the problem is that doesn't exist. And so the make and model, Brianna has already pulled together all of the data on make and model, all the data on what electric vehicles, what are electric vehicles by make and model. So once we got the actual data from the town, we could then do a cross reference to tag it as electric. Well, I'm going to send the town manager a request to try to facilitate this. And Brianna, you can try to do the continued on the treasurer and we'll see which one gets the info first. This is part of my ongoing Thank effort you. to understand our processes and data collection and responsiveness. So. And Chris Sr. was kind of helping us. He recommended we go to the treasurer collector after the assessor's office and the RMV didn't work. I've been searching for this data since I was hired in August or the fall. So it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, no promises on the results, but I'll just continue. Brianna, okay. we, for, for, in Hingham, where we did a search, it was like two years ago. I might have sent you that list, but they just basically just printed out EV. There's a list of EV in the in the type of car. It doesn't tell you who the owner is. Because I know the Kingdom has, I think it was like 117. And Cohasa wasn't that far behind. No, yeah. And those were the numbers of, I believe, uh, with the EV designation. Correct. And all EVs do have the EV license plates, except for the, except for the other ones, the hybrids and and the other vehicles they don't have it but you're more concerned with the electric ev cars yeah but i didn't think it was a requirement for the cars which is why i hadn't it's not they ask you if you want it or not and i've seen quite a few teslas driving around without ev plates so it's a, it's a it's a choice i know that mm. okay well keep on keeping on I, I, I feel that victory is possible. It's just all of a sudden we're going to crack the nut and then we'll have the data, which is good. Um, thank you, Brianna, for all your efforts on this. Okay, sustainability initiative update. We're going to defer this because Pat's not here unless somebody else has something to report. Um, I just want to add that we have sustainability uh, guest speakers lined up for the summer. So hopefully in August, we'll be hearing from individuals from Concord. Um, and you'll all be getting resources on things Concord is doing, including electric bus um, happenings. So we'll be sending that information out to you guys. Who do we have lined up for July for our speaker? Yeah, Brian Folds confirmed with me. He'll be our guest speaker for July. And I told him by the end of this week, if he is doesn't can't guarantee it, he should tell me. And he didn't. So we're, he's confirmed. And that's for electric buses? Yes. Concord. Concord's electric buses, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
community aggregation. Um, Steve, anything on this other than? Well, okay, I, I'll report a couple little things. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, uh, John O'Rourke of Good Energy sent an email to Chris Sr. saying that the DPU needed documentation um, as to our, you know, the exact wording of our uh, Warren article that we originally passed for for community solar for uh, aggregation, uh, together with the uh, official vote tally. I, I'm I, I'm just really I don't understand why that hasn't <laughs> been sent to the DPU a year and a half ago. But anyways, uh, that's way where we are. And I just checked the. Um, uh, Cohasset docket with the DPU today, and as of today, it doesn't appear that that information has been passed on the DPU. So I, I don't understand what why there's a problem here, <laughs> but that's what I found out. Uh, okay, so that's it on our updates. Um, is there any new business that? was not, could not have been known within 40 hours, eight hours in advance? I Just one thing is maybe, uh, I, I wanna mention that the Sustainable South Shore is, is uh, sorry. I just wanna mention that Sustainable South Shore is having a, a Zoom meeting on the 29th uh, of this month and, um, the, the chair of the, of the committee is uh, wondering whether somebody from Alternative Energy could get, give an update as to what uh, uh, Alternative Energy is doing in Cohasset. So I'm wondering, Tanya, can you uh, possibly drop by and, and give that report or would it be, I don't, I don't think it Is it by Zoom or is it in person? Is it by Zoom or in? Zoom. Is it by Zoom or in person? Yeah. Zoom. Okay, and when is it? The 29th, June 29th. Um, in the evening? Yeah, I think it starts at seven. Okay, yes, then I can do that. Okay, I'll send you, uh, I'll send you the information then. That would be great, that would be great. And, and so copy much. Brianna as well. All right, all right. Okay, all right, good. Um, yep. For the electrical aggregation, should it be, I mean, is that, is that something that we should um, be uh, pushing? Is that that the DPU get that information? Is that an action item, or is that not in our uh, in our court, or what? Well, I uh, I tried to get over to John and Rorick today, uh, but I called him too late to, for him to get back to me. I think um, maybe the first thing to do was simply ask Chris, as he sent that information to John, and then it's in John's ballpark. Um, I know I noticed that uh, Good Energy requested a delay in responding to DBU data requests. So I take that as meaning that they either didn't get the information from uh, from Chris or they haven't had a chance to uh, put it together in a package to send to the DBU. But uh, we could, you know, I, I'd be glad to call Chris or maybe Brianna could just uh, ask him the question. And uh, I'm sure John Rorick will get back to me probably tomorrow. Um, to let me know what the situation is. Okay, so let's do this as the action items. Steve, if you could follow up with John O'Rourke on the status, and Brianna, if you can find, talk to Chris or have Michelle talk to Chris and find out what's going on with that. That is not hard, that is public data, so it shouldn't be hard to uh, obtain the warrant language. The only issue is the, um, I don't think we necessarily take account so if it passes, it well, passes. Well, I think it passed unanimously, so <laughs> that would be well, recorded. If it, if it did, that's great. Um, so it should be recorded and easy enough to send. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you for the update. Anything else? All right. Thank you again. Our next meeting is going to be July... Second Thursday in July, which will be July 8th. And um, if there's anything you'd like me to put on the agenda, please let me know. But otherwise, look forward to seeing you guys July 8th.
Thank you.